Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Steve Jewell. I'm with Community Giving, and we're just going to give people a few moments to log on and as we prepare to get started with our webinar today. We have a number of people registered, and uh, so we'll just give a couple minutes and wait for everybody to log on. So again, welcome to everybody who's just joining us. Um, we're just waiting a couple minutes to allow people to log on and we'll get started here in just a minute or two. So good afternoon, everybody. Again, my name is Steve Jewell. I work with Community Giving and uh, we're very happy uh, that you could all join us today and um, want you to know that we're um, thinking about all of you. And as we talked about last week, we started this uh, webinar se series um, to really stay in contact and stay in connection with uh, communities that we serve and really uh, to do what we can to help support um, all the nonprofits in our region and some of you who may have joined from um, beyond. Um, we're pleased to have you with us and we're looking forward to today's presentation. Um, as we talked about this last week, you know, this is really um, a situation where we're all in this together and anything we can do to help each other out, that's, that's what we wanna be doing. So um, thank you for joining us. And just a couple quick reminders. One is to please keep your microphone on mute. We will have an opportunity for questions, so um, submit your questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of the page, and we will get to um, hopefully all of your questions. Um, and um, at the end of the uh, webinar, we'll talk about what we have on deck for next week. So once again, welcome, and I'd like to turn things over to Carl Samp. He is the Executive Director of the Brainerd Lakes Area Community Foundation. So, Carl. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending, and thank you for the, all that you're doing for our communities. We really appreciate your work at this uh, absolutely critical time. So um, I'm just here to inform you about another opportunity for, for uh, developing finances in that I will be leading a webinar workshop on grant writing and other fund development strategies through St. Cloud State University on April 28th from 1 to 5 in the afternoon. And so the information you hear today from Sam uh, used to be part of the work that workshop that we did when it was a full day session. And so it's a great opportunity for you to hear that up front now uh, in where to find grant opportunities. And then we'll talk about uh, grant writing strategies from the perspective of a 20 year uh, grant reviewer. And uh, we'll also talk about other fund development strategies and developing a case statement. So uh, please contact me uh, at the Please contact me, sorry about not having my video on. <laughs> Please contact me at the uh, email address on the screen and uh, I'll get you more information on that. That is a fee-based session, by the way. Um, next up is Kathy Grakow, our Director of Community Programs. And uh, Kathy, take it away. Thank you. Uh, Community Giving has been a subscribing partner of the Foundation Center since 2009. Through our subscription, we provide free access to the Foundation Center's Now Candid's uh, searchable database with over 150,000 foundations and are typically accessed 
accessible only within the physical locations of the foundation centers library locations such as the central minnesota community foundation in st cloud and the wilmer area community foundation in wilmer and other uh, locations such as the minneapolis public library before i turn it over to our presenter i just wanted to highlight a couple of resources uh, to assist nonprofits with their financial resiliency and support. You will see those uh, listed on your screen uh, to include Propel Nonprofits and Network for Good. Propel Nonprofits, um, uh, those are temporarily at no cost and you can reach Kate Barr directly by going to the website and you will see her uh, listed in the staff listing there. Um, Additionally, uh, for Network for Good, they are offering some sessions that actually launched yesterday, but they have some excellent training opportunities aligned with fundraising during these difficult times. As a result of COVID-19 pandemic and the subsequent closing of our offices, the Foundation Center is providing access to our partners at no charge. We are pleased to have Samantha Petticord from Candid joining us today who will share the multiple resources available that are accessible to nonprofits related to financial resources, statistical information to support your grant writing, grant writing resources, as well as a live demo of the searchable database that I referenced. Samantha is the Network Engagement Manager for the Midwest and actively supports a territory of 13 states. She comes to Candid with a deep knowledge of the nonprofit sector. Please welcome Sam Petticord. Sam. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you and good, mor good morning and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sam Petticord, and I, as Kathy mentioned, I'm the Candid's Funding Information Network Manager. Um, thank you for joining us today, and thank you for those that are hosting the webinar. I just have time to give you a brief overview of some resources that may be helpful and valuable during this difficult time. Um, and There we go. So first, let me get started by giving a brief over, overview of Candid. Candid gets you the information to do good. On February 1st, a Foundation Center and GuideStar join forces to create a new organization called Candid. Together, we bring more than 88 years of expertise and millions of data points to the sector. If you're unfamiliar with us, you can find us locally at a list of locations. Um, we call them the Funding Information Network. As Kathy mentioned, her organization is one of them. Uh, we do have six local, um, so we're lucky to have these partners offering these resources um, generously to you for free. Uh, and you can find out which one is the nearest location to you by visiting our website at candid.org slash find us if you're unfamiliar with these locations. As Kathy mentioned, due to the health crisis, COVID-19, most of these organizations are closed at this time but they are currently offering remote resources to you at no charge. And so I'm gonna briefly explain how to tap into some of those resources um, while you're working remotely. So um, we do have a shifted most of our programming to online uh, during this time. Luckily, Candid has a wealth of ways and helpful resources that we can help you. Um, there's a complete list of all the resources that are specific to funds and emergency funds established for the COVID-19 crisis. Um, you can see here at the bottom, there's this bit.ly link. Um, no worries about copying that down. You will receive a copy of this presentation after we're done. Um, so you'll get all the links that I mentioned and, and include for your, uh, for your benefit. Candid created this pop-up site called candid.org slash COVID coronavirus, uh, and it's just a, a great curation of resources. Um, I don't really have time to go into each one of these, um, but if you have a moment, check out the site. Um, you can get up-to-date funding information, funding summaries, lists of grant distributions, all the news and information you need to keep up to date. We're currently updating this website every 15 minutes, and so it's one of the most comprehensive curated resources for disaster philanthropy available anywhere online. And so maybe today after the webinar, you can take a chance to check it out. It's candid.org slash coronavirus. We will have also a webinar that we're teaching tomorrow for free. That's tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
includes, you can find it on our Grantspace website, where we'll be going into more depth in each one of these categories. So, uh, all of you are going to have remote access to the Foundation directory online, as I mentioned, and I'm going to be able to demo that for a moment. Um, but I want to make sure that you know that at home, you have lots of resources that you could be using during this time. Um, the main one is the Foundation Directory Online to help you do prospecting and grant research. But there's also the Minnesota Foundation Stats, and that's available at minnesota.foundationcenter.org, where you can see a comprehensive list of information about the, the philanthropic sector in Minnesota. Um, we also have our website, GuideStar. Uh, if you're not familiar with GuideStar.org, also please check it out. It's very helpful and you can use it this time to look at for potential partners and for leaders in different sectors um, to see who can help supplement or who can help work um, that you're already currently doing. Grantspace.org is another product of Candid. Um, it is as a wonderful resource. It's our online virtual learning platform. Um, right now you can use this time to keep up to date on, on all of your professional development. Um, we're offering lots of free webinars. The one that I mentioned tomorrow, um, specifically on resources for organizations that are affected by COVID-19. Um, but we also offer a free collection of over 300 e-books that are specifically um, dedicated to help organizations um, increase their understanding of, of leadership, fund development, and governance uh, for the nonprofit sector. Our, our webinars and um, self-paced learning, uh, self-paced learning webinars uh, online, uh, we have over 500. And so you're able to attend most of those for free. And then we do have more intermediary and advanced webinars available as well. So if we have time, I can show you grantspace.org. Um, but if you're familiar, please check it out uh, here shortly. Uh, the Central Minnesota Community Foundation is generously extending remote access to the Foundation Directory Online to users while their organization is closed. In the meantime, you can use uh, an encrypted link that we can get out to all of you attending the webinar today, and you can follow it in our notes at the follow-up email, um, where you can access the, the database from home. As Kathy mentioned, normally you can only access this uh, resource at the locations that I listed in the beginning, six locations. Um, but during this time, we're going to be extending it to everyone to access remotely for free. So I'm going to be able to give you a brief overview of how to use the database um, to look for funding matches. Um, while I log into the database, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that this database is intended for users that are already affiliated with a 501c3, a nonprofit, or already have a fiscal sponsor in place, and that would be competitive for a grant. And so if your organization is new and it's just starting um, and perhaps you haven't had many years of program services under your belt, you might want to wait um, before jumping into this database. We have lots of other resources that could help you get started in your initial quest for funding. This is specifically for organizations that are competitive uh, for grant makers. Um, if you're not sure how to write a proposal or if you're not sure how to do a budget or any other piece of, of the process, um, we do offer lots of free resources, sample documents, and trainings available at grantspace.org. So um, when you're ready to take this step, I'm going to switch screens here real quick. Okay. And Once you log into the, the database at home, you're going to see here in the top right hand corner, it says Hi Central Minnesota Community Foundation. That way you'll know that you've been provided access by the Community Foundation and that you are able to, to enjoy Foundation Directory Online as Central from home. Uh, if you've never used Foundation Directory Online, there's lots of different resources to help you get started. One of which is here at the bottom. If you scroll down, there's a blog, there's um, uh, online resources. We have a YouTube channel here that you can you can watch videos um, that take you step by step on how to use the database. It's pretty intuitive though. Um, so we're going to give you a brief overview of, of how to use the database and I want to use an example from a question that we got earlier and it was looking for funding for homeless shelters in Minnesota. 
This database is similar to Google. You can type in native speech and then it will it will populate that into search terms and it will break down your your search into a taxonomy that grant makers use. So it sounds difficult, but it's actually quite simple. So let me show you here. Uh, let's look at for shelters. Let's, let's be specific and do homeless shelters for men in Minnesota. You can see here in the top, it took my basic search term and it broke it down into the following. I always recommend going right to the advanced search and filters, which is this tab here. If you click on that, you can see how it has broken down your, your search. Your subject area, you can match any or you can match all if you want to get very specific. In this case, I don't think dining services are appropriate, but homeless services, homeless shelters, and housing for the homeless is what we're looking for. If you're not exactly sure or if you want to add terms to your search, you can always click in the box. And here you'll see a breakdown of the parent uh, child relationship between all of the categories. We do have a, a complete taxonomy where you can search specifically if, if you're not sure how to word your program service area or if you're not sure how to word um, type of uh, funding request. Um, but usually it's pretty intuitive. Um, for if you're an arts and culture organization, you can scroll down and you can see you want to fund performing arts. I can get very specific and say I want to fund theater and then I can keep going and keep going until I get a very narrow search. In this case, we want to limit our geographic focus to where the funding is going to be spent. So while you're looking for funders, and we cover all this in our class, inter Introduction to Finding Grants, um, you want to be wide but not too wide. And so the net that you cast um, has, has, to be, has to be doable. And so right now we're coming up with 515 grant makers that fund these specific categories in the state of Minnesota, that's too many. It's too many for you to, to really sit down and, and to go one by one and look at to see who is a good fit and, and who would be an interest in, in your, your services. So you can, you can leave it at the state level, you can narrow it down to the county level, you can narrow it down to a city or a greater metropolis area. Um, you can even do congressional districts. And so you, you can get quite narrow uh, with your geographical focus. Um, in this case, we're going to leave it at Minnesota just for today's sake, um, but just know that you can you can slim that down if, if that's helpful for your search. For population serve, you want to specifically uh, delineate who the money is going to be spent on. So who is benefiting from the program and services that you're applying the grant money for? In this case, we have homeless people, out of home youth, young men, Adolescent boys also know that you can tap in and you can break it down um, by different demographics, whichever would be most helpful for, for your search. A couple other boxes here that might be helpful in narrowing down your search. Here, organization name. You can type in the name of a specific grant maker or recipient. So this, for example, I would clear all these other boxes and I would type in uh, the Wilmer Community Foundation and it would bring up their grant maker profile. And we're gonna look at a grant maker profile here shortly, um, but you could see in all about the foundation and learn who they're, who they're funding, um, their funding program areas and limitations and, and so forth. Um, also, you could type in a recipient. So if there is someone who is similar to your organization or someone who's doing similar work, you can put in the name of their organization and then you can see who's funding them and then kind of do a reverse uh, search or reverse engineer the terms that they use to describe their programming if that's helpful to get you started. Sometimes it is helpful, sometimes it just gives you more insight on, on prospects that you haven't maybe thought of. I usually leave location uh, blank just because personally I don't care where the money comes from, uh, but if you're looking for organizations that are based locally or state organizations, you could type in Minnesota as well. And that would restrict you to funders that are based in the state of Minnesota. So again, geographical focus is where the money is going to be spent. Location is where the money is coming from. Who's who is helpful. If you know someone at an organization and you want to be connected to their organization directly, 
So for example, um, your neighbor is a board member at a, a grant making organization. I can't remember which. You could type in the name of your grant make, sorry, you could type in the name of your neighbor and it will pull up any organization that they have an affiliation with on LinkedIn. We use LinkedIn to populate uh, this particular uh, search bar. Additional features will, will help you narrow down even further. If, for example, you are only looking for funds that are specific to a capital campaign, uh, you can search just capital infrastructure. That way it will take all of the, of the grant makers that do not fund that out of your search to help clean up your list. Um, some grant makers have very specific uh, support strategies. Others are more general or more, or more open. Um, but I know, for example, there's some grant makers who don't fund equipment. And then there's some grant makers who only fund equipment. And so if you specifically need equipment for this proposal, go ahead and type in equipment, and that way we can narrow down your match. Transaction type is if you are looking for a specific uh, type of transaction. For example, if your organization is fundraising for um, matching grants and you need to, to raise money for just um, matching grants from employees, you can search specifically for that. We usually leave this empty unless it's a specific campaign that that restricts your funding. All right, and then down here, we'll skip down to the amount. If you look at uh, the sliding scale here, you can specifically type in a number or you can use the sliding scale. For example, if you only wanna write a grant that's for $5,000 or more, you can narrow that down to 5,000. Perhaps this is way too much money for your small organization and you want something a little bit smaller. You can search for grants that are between 5,000 and 100,000, say. Our database goes all the way back to 2003. Uh, we index grants um, every single day. Uh, we, we pull from the IRS, we pull from the I-90s, we pull from websites, we pull from uh, white papers, um, web scraping, all kinds of uh, direct e-reports from our community foundations and partners all over the world. Um, but then also just direct interviews with CEOs, trustees, and board members uh, who give us access to their grant, their grantee files. It's a lot of information, um, and perhaps you might want to narrow that down so you're looking for something a little bit more up to date. If you want to say you want to only look for grants available from the last 10 years, you can narrow it down from 2010 to 2020. And then once you hit search, it will update our results. And see now we narrowed it down to 234. Generally, I would, I would probably go even more narrow, um, but in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and show you one of the uh, grant maker profiles to kind of give you an idea of what you can expect and, and how you can use this to help you at home. I'm going to go ahead and oh, first let me say uh, so the grant makers are sorted by grants given, not by dollar amount. A lot of people get that confused. Um, we automatically sort by grant count. So uh, this top organization here has the most grants given specifically for these search terms. Hold on one second, I'm sorry. Your slide. Hopefully everyone sees the uh, the directory again. Um, sorry about that. So I'm going to go ahead and choose the the Minneapolis fund to give you an example of what you can expect. There's a little tour here that populates in the top corner. Um, for today's sake, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that. Um, this year shows us that the Minneapolis Foundation is a grant reporter. So our most up-to-date information from them is uh, very recently, it's only two weeks old. Um, so we're continually getting up-to-date information from this grant maker. You can see the information in a variety of ways. In the beginning, we have their, their website. You can skip down to the who's who or the contact. Um, I like to look at these graphs though, just to kind of give me an idea of what their funding priorities are. If you look here, you can see education and arts and culture. 
are the two most funded categories that this grant maker makes. You can see specifically how much money that they spend in each of these categories. You can see, you can hover over at the states and get a, a more detailed um, understanding of how many grants, recipients, and dollars funded in each area. You can see here that on this third chart that um, the typical grant size that they give is 5,000 or less. So they do award grants that are more, um, but this might help you in determining your initial uh, request. And so unless it specifically uh, states how much um, how much the fund is, is, is giving out at this time or, or for a specific cause, um, you have a good idea that they generally fund organizations at the 5,000 or less level. I'm going to scroll down here just so you can kind of see a little bit more about the organization. In these boxes, you can learn about uh, their geographical focus. You can learn about the subjects that they care most about and that they're currently funding. The reason that we, we index all of this is because past grant making is the best indication of future grant making. And so we here have a, a very comprehensive look at their portfolio and who they funded over the last uh, 17 years. And so this will help you kind of gain insight that is valuable to you before you go ahead and make that initial request. So everything I'm showing you here is, is all um, helpful homework, basically, and research that you want to do um, before you before you even sit down and write an LOI, before you even sit down and, and make that initial outreach. This is all your prep work um, to make sure that you are the right fit, to make sure that you don't waste your time and the grant maker's time, and that um, before you go through this whole process that you have a really um, you have a good sense of their mission alignment and, and where you fit into their funding profile. As I scroll down, it's going to give me related funds. And so it'll, it'll usually suggest a few other organizations that fund at similarly or at similar levels. You can learn more about the organization, which I highly recommend. Uh, do your homework. Do your homework. Uh, always research an organization before you reach out to them. And then if I keep scrolling down, and get to this section here, the applications and RFPs. This will give you specific uh, detail on how to apply for funding. And so usually it is pretty step-by-step. -step. Um, it will tell you the initial approach. They're interested in getting a letter of inquiry first. Uh, this tells me when their board meetings are, and then it tells me when I would get the final notification. Sometimes this is one of your, I guess, um, most important indicators and whether or not they'd be a good fit. For example, if you need funding right now, um, this might not be the this might not be the the best match for you. Generally, we say that you should start your um, prospecting eight to eight months to a year out, um, just so you know when all the grant cycles fall and you are are able to comply within their timeline. So give yourself enough time to make. The proposals and, and to make sure that you have everything that they need. So if they request an audit or if they request um, financial statements, that your organization isn't scrambling at the last minute. So you really want to have a long view of uh, how your organization is being funded and, and be able to plan ahead um, about a year in advance so in order to make sure that you comply and, and fall into all of these timelines. If you keep scrolling down here, these are the I would say hard limits, your, the giving limitations of this organization. Um, it says that they are given limited to Minneapolis, with emphasis on organizations in the Twin Cities and the metro area. Okay, so if you get through all the way through this part and everything looks good, everything matches up with your organization, um, you are compliant, you, you meet all the requirements, the deadline will match your funding needs, um, then you can continue to read on and consider them as a viable prospect for your organization. Down below, we have um, very specific information about their assets. And so if you want to take uh, a deeper dive into the, the organization's assets, you can get an overview or you can specifically view their 990s. And again, these go back generally about 17 years for most of our organizations. If you keep scrolling down here, um, you're going to be able to see their trusts, their trustees. 
Um, so you can you can look and compare and say, you know, uh, is, it'd be helpful to know someone at the organization. That is not uh, necessarily a, um, a guarantee or even a necessity, um, but it doesn't hurt to look and see if you have a connection or someone on your board has a connection and they're help, able to make an introduction. It always helps. Um, and also it kind of helps you understand who you're crafting your LOI for or who you're crafting your um, proposal for. Down here, we can also see the staff. And so if you have questions, um, if you have, um, sometimes there's a specific program manager that you can reach out to and get help or get more insight on a particular grant. Uh, and then down further, are communications from this organization. And so if you wanna learn about um, what they're doing in the public, if you wanna learn where they are, uh, resources that they're currently offering, events that they're hosting, annual meetings, we link you directly to their social media accounts um, and then any white papers or publications that they have recently produced. And so I'm gonna keep scrolling down here and then there's this little box all the way at the bottom that says additional contact. Uh, this is information if you get stuck. And so if you need extra help on, on a grant proposal or if you get through the application and, and you're not sure about an attachment or if uh, you have a general question. Usually this contact information here is, is who you want to reach out to. And so that was a very, very, very quick um, overview of a grant maker's profile. I just wanted to kind of give you uh, an insight on, on what you could expect when you when you're researching from home. Um, in addition to, to uh, like these profile views, you, if you go back to the main view, scroll down here. Uh, you can always go to view all. And tour. And here this little box here. Um, you can download a PDF of this results. Or you can save it as uh, an Excel file. So uh, you can only export 100 as a list or 10 complete uh, profiles of grant makers. And so, for example, if you want to begin the search, you want to do your homework, you can save the grant makers profile, you could share it with a staff member, you could just keep it on hand so you have it as a resource later on. So you can export 10 at a time, or you can export a list of 100 organizations if you want to sit down and, and use that to kind of uh, guide your process. And so, that's a very brief overview of Foundation Directory Online. If you have questions, and if you're unfamiliar with the database, that's fine. Um, as I mentioned, there's YouTube tutorials, um, but then there's also this helpful little chat feature here. This chat feature will actually link you to one of our librarians. Um, we have a team of about 20 different librarians that are, in, are staffed full time, and they're able to answer your questions uh, during normal business hours on the East Coast. Uh, and so you can always, um, if you're not getting results that you need or if you need help narrowing or, for example, uh, there's a misinformation or you need a contact information for a grant maker and it's not listed, you can always chat with one of our librarians to get help. And so that is a very, very brief overview of uh, the Foundation Directory Online. Um, again, this is normally provided at those locations that I initially gave you. Um, but because they're closed, we're offering it to you remotely. And so you can access it at home for free um, using an encrypted link that we will share with you. You don't need a password. Um, we'll automatically log you in and you can automatically start using it. Um, you can start exporting and, and emailing yourself. This little icon here will allow you to email any results to yourself or to other team members. Now, while this, organ this site is specifically for um, this, I'm sorry, this uh, database is specifically for past grants. So it's not going to include um, grants that have just became newly available, such as emergency funds that are, are being available during this time. And so I have, a, I have a brief list of about 20 different local community foundations um, that are offering emergency grants for the coronavirus. 
at the end, I believe we're going to get a few little highlights from, from our representatives who are here on the, on the call um, to let you know how to apply. You will get this PowerPoint with each one of these having a link that will directly take you to the application. And so if it's helpful, you can use this as a starting point. Um, these are usually smaller grants, and these are usually grants that are specific to organizations that, that need emergency funding during this time. And so um, this can supplement, really, the Foundation Directory Online, and this can be used uh, to help you in your search for funding during this time, especially if you've been impacted and you're unable to keep your doors open. And if you had a gala or a ticketed or, or a walk or, or some other kind of event that had to be canceled due to um, the coronavirus. And so hopefully this is a helpful list. Um, our, like I said, in, in a moment here, we're going to hear a little bit more about how to access uh, these resources. But lastly, I just want to say um, it's really important that you take the time. Um, and, I, and I know it's really hard to do right now, but take the time to to measure your outcomes and to measure the work that you're doing um, because you want to be able to showcase what your nonprofit is doing during this difficult time. And so um, give yourself time to do that, to tell your story, and that will help you later on when you're communicating with funders on why they should fund your organization. Um, also give yourself time and space to adjust your fundraising plan. We should be looking at least six months out. I know things are changing very fast right now, um, but you want to Touch base with previous funders if you haven't already. Look ahead and see who, who you have um, coming down the pipeline and you're prospecting. And just really make sure that you're, you're able to be flexible enough and agile enough uh, if you need to apply for additional funds during this time. I gave you a list of uh, ways that you can research emergency funds. Um, again, we're hosting a webinar tomorrow if you need more information on that. Or you can visit candid.org slash coronavirus to see a complete list of organizations that are providing emergency funds. And lastly, just, you know, if you have downtime, if your organization has downtime, um, you can continue to develop your professional development by using grantspace.org, uh, which has over 500 and some um, videos, webinars, virtual learning uh, resources that you can use at home um, and take advantage of this time to kind of catch up and continue your professional development. And last but not least, I just want to say thank you. I know that was incredibly quick. I apologize. I had to talk very fast. Um, if you have more questions, if you need help, feel free to use the Ask Us feature on our website or contact me directly at sam.pedicord.org. And then we'll have questions here in a moment at the end of this as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. All right. Hi, Sam. This is Sarah Carlson with the Wilmer Area Community Foundation, and we do have a couple of questions queued up for you. So I'm going to start with that. And while I do that, I'm going to encourage those that are participating in today's webinar, if you have a question, go down to the bottom of your screen and click the Q&A box and type your question in, and then we can answer that for you. So Sam, one of the questions that was emailed into us ahead of time was do foundations today assume some degree of crowdsourced revenue uh, should be folded into the income stream uh, that a particular nonprofit might be posing in their grant application? Or are you seeing grant makers adjust giving accordingly and being mindful that crowdsourcing is difficult right now? Both. So um, usually I would say that um, most organizations, especially newer organizations, uh, depend heavily on individual donations to make up a large percentage of their of their income. And so we constantly preach to diversify your funding. You should never be completely dependent on grants as, a, as your income or your revenue model. Um, but crowdsourcing is a, a wonderful tool and it's usually very helpful. Um, statistically, it's something like 70% of organizations five years or under are are being funded by individual donors. Um, at this time though, it is very hard uh, to get those individual donations. Um, we do offer classes online that we can help you cultivate um, donors relationships with individual donors. Um, I would say that donors at this time are understanding that you, you may be getting less than you would normally um, due to the financial hardship that 
this time has brought on for everyone. And so I would say generally, um, it's, it's a wonderful resource and, and it should be part of your funding mix and you should continue to explore that option and you should continue to develop it. Um, but at this time, I think funders are aware that there is some hardships and that organizations just aren't getting the funding levels that they're normal. Um, but I would continue to, to make sure that you are communicating with your audiences about the work you're doing. And so when the economy picks back up, you're able to, to jump back into crowdsourcing and individual donations. Thank you, Sam. I know that we would certainly say at Community Giving that this is a great time to be harvesting your stories and telling the stories of your impact and keeping track of those stories so that we can see the work that you've been doing during this time. And then when you're honest with us about you've lost a fundraiser or something like that, we also can see the impact you were still able to do. So mm -hmm. do use this time to position yourself to strengthen your grant application when the time comes and you're ready to submit again. Um, another question that just was a little more clarification for you, Sam. Any hints that you might have for our participants who are engaged in advocacy as one of their primary mission points um, and finding grants or funders that will fund advocacy? You can support, I'm sorry, you can use the Foundation Directory Online to, to search uh, for advocacy. If, if you are having trouble finding that as a, as a result in your funding search, um, again, feel free to use the, the ask us feature or you can email me directly your question and I can I can see if I can play around with it and see if I can find the magic combination of terms to help you get better results. Um, but there's not there's not a specific uh, profile or, or or set of funders that I can think of that that only fund advocacy um, unless you are a PAC and then that's a whole other um, that's a whole other uh, mix of funding options that are available to you. Thank you. All right, that concludes the submitted questions uh, for us right now. We can keep the Q&A panel open for a little while. So if a question has still percolating in your mind, feel free to take a look at it. And while we engage our community leadership to address other things, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. Steve? Thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Sam. It was a wonderful presentation. And again, if people have additional questions, please feel free to um, submit them uh, below or directly to Sam as well. We're now going to move to just some brief updates from the communities we serve. And uh, we're going to have each of the executive directors of the communities we serve, where there's a local community foundation, say a few words. So we'll start with Carl Samp again. Carl is with the Brainerd Lakes Area Community Foundation. Thank you again, Steve. Uh, there I am. Um, we have started the Brainerd Lakes Area Response Fund, and uh, we've currently uh, made eight grants from that for about $38,000. And then uh, we've also made uh, three grants for $12,000 for emergency financial assistance from one of our donor funds that were established um, right before this time, and, and they wanted to support uh, emergency financial situation. So we've put out about $50,000 $50, now uh, in grants that are supporting uh, organizations or the, the folks that are impacted by uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have about 50,000 more to give away. Uh, we'll take uh, proposals on a weekly basis. Um, everything that comes in by early Tuesday morning, um, we'll take a look at and our uh, grant committee meets Thursday mornings to make those decisions. Sometimes we're able to make some decisions just uh, online as well. So it's usually a pretty quick turnaround. So we encourage you to go to the community giving website and click the COVID-19 tab at the top. And uh, in the drop down below, you'll see the list of all the response funds under there. Uh, we generally are funding right now projects that relate to food, uh, to financial emergency situations, and mental health impact have been the, the three most common things. Uh, one thing we're not doing is uh, kind of covering salaries to keep uh, organizational staff employed. We're encouraging you to use the CARES Act funding, the federal funding, or uh, rely on the state unemployment uh, insurance program for salary related issues. So 
Thank you. I'll turn it over to Sarah Wilmer now. Thank you everybody for attending today and thank you, Carl. On behalf of the boards that we all represent, I just wanna take a moment to thank you all for the work that you are doing to support our neighbors and our communities during this challenging time. And for taking a minute today to learn about a powerful tool that you can use during this time while you're strategically considering how to fund and diversify your resources. Um, on behalf of the Wilmer Area Community Foundation, all I can say is we really look forward to the day when we can host you back in our offices to use the foundation directory online in person. And I know our sister foundation in St. Cloud does as well. Uh, the response funds for both the Wilmer and the Sox Center Area Community Foundations are active and ready to assist. Um, our focus areas are similar to those in Brainerd. We will focus initially on relief phase, specifically immediate basic needs, first line of defense, kind of safety minded things and mental health. Um, nonprofits with these missions can certainly apply now for up to $5,000 to use immediately. And we are holding some of our funding in reserve to assist more proactively in the recovery phase. Um, and those dollars will include flexible operating funding for nonprofits that are based in our respective geographies. Um, we are not currently accepting recovery phase applications yet, but if you want to watch the communitygiving.org website and our COVID-19 tab, you'll be able to keep tabs on all, how all of our foundations are pivoting and changing to these times. Our initial response fund grants are going out now. Um, and we are in the process of reviewing our new grants that have been submitted for this week. We do a end of day Monday application cycle and then we begin review on Tuesdays. Dollars will go out right away the following week for those applications that have been funded. Um, community foundations also really play an important role locally when we are trying to focus on community leadership and assist civic and other community leaders to respond to critical and emerging needs. All of your community foundations on this call are engaged in this work and we, our staff are all trying to help leaders be innovative and responsive as the situation unfolds. If there are ever any questions you might have in the Wilmer or the Sox Center areas, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. Uh, we are here to help you. Um, now I would like to invite my colleague, Kathy Gracco back, who's going to share a similar update on behalf of our sister partner foundation, the Alexandria Area Community Foundation. Hi, um, thank you once again. And um, for the Alexandria Area Response Fund, the balance currently is $38,000 with the Grants Committee having their first uh, round reviewing proposals that have come in um, on Thursday. And um, as Sarah mentioned, you can check the Community Givings website under COVID for updates to all of our response funds that are associated uh, with community giving. At this point, I'll turn it over to, to Carol to spotlight the Central Minnesota Community Foundation. Carol. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, the Central Minnesota Community Foundation's uh, response fund is very similar to Wilmer's in that uh, currently we are concentrating on unmet immediate needs. Uh, it, we're working in partnership with United Way and the Initiative Foundation, um, looking at the resources that we all have available to make sure that we're utilizing our money as strategically as possible. Um, we do have money reserved for uh, recovery, post-recovery, and that's when we'll be looking at projects as far as operating needs for nonprofits. So currently it's the immediate needs that we're concentrating on. We uh, met uh, this week and actually earlier today and did our second round of grants. So we have $35,000 that has been granted out of our fund. Uh, we have a total of $165,000 in that um, response fund for Central Minnesota Community Foundation, which concentrates on Stearns, Benton, and Sherburne counties. We also have Foley uh, with $2,100 available. Painesville has $4,400 available. And the Vercory Community Foundation also has a response fund of $9,900 available. 
You can find all of those response funds on the communitygiving.org um, site. So, and if you have any questions at all, please be sure to give us a call. We can be reached by calling our business lines, even though we are working from home, we have that magic way of being able to get our phones forwarded to us. So we want to be as available and responsive as possible. I also want to mention that uh, United Way and ourselves are working on another venture to try to connect donors to current needs. And so we're going to start taking our get on the bus tour that we've done in the past and turn it into a virtual tour. Our first one will be uh, next Monday at four o'clock. So we'll be inviting donors and um, we're gonna stretch it out into the general public to try to get as many people involved and aware of the needs in our community. So uh, we uh, cannot do everybody all at once. So we are selecting four uh, nonprofits this week and uh, every other week we'll be doing another virtual tour. And so please consider joining us for that as well. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Steve Jewell to talk about Carver County. Thank you, Carol. And uh, some of you are aware we also are helping and working with the Community Foundation for Carver County. Um, Carver County's uh, Community Foundation has been around for a while. Um, we did not have a, um, as much money as we would like to distribute yet with that response fund, but the board did meet last week and uh, has distributed or is in the process of distributing about $25,000. And uh, that's in the form of six or seven grants to um, various nonprofits that are serving Carver County. And uh, we're hopeful that we're gonna see some additional dollars come into that response fund so that we actually could do more. The board there is very interested and concerned about um, a number of the issues that we're all concerned about and they wanna do whatever they can to support the community and support the nonprofits in, in Carver County. Um, I'm just wondering as before we go to, to close, um, Sarah, do you know if we have any other last questions? We have a couple minutes left um, before we close out. There are no additional questions that have been submitted yet. Okay. Well, I don't think anybody has ever um, been opposed to finishing early. It uh, gives everybody time to stretch before your next uh, Zoom call or webinar, whatever it is that you have. Uh, we want to just, first of all, like Sarah said earlier and other speakers have as well, just say thank you to you who are on the ground providing vital, important services to the communities um, in our region. Um, things don't just happen, and um, without the strong, vibrant nonprofit sector, um, our communities are worse off. And, and we just can't say enough to thank you for what you're doing to serve your community. And again, um, we're here to be a resource to support you in any way that we can. That's our role and as a community foundation. Um, we are going to have all these resources up on the web. We also will have PowerPoints available to send out. Um, we do invite your feedback and comments at info at communitygiving.org. Just send us your thoughts, your feedback. Um, if you have ideas or topics you think would be good for us to feature and discuss here on the webinar series, um, that's what it's here for. So please do send us your ideas and your suggestions. Next week, um, we're fortunate to have a gentleman by the name of Joe Teagues. Some of you may know Joe. He is a plan giving expert. He's an attorney. Um, and uh, we know that plan giving also is some one of those things that isn't necessarily immediate. But we do know when you have low interest rates in the economy, um, that sometimes there's some gift vehicles that people and nonprofits should be thinking about. Um, gift annuities are one of those. Um, uh, areas. Um, people are a little skittish about investing in the stock market. Their CDs are only returning um, a, a, a less than 1%. And um, they may have already named you in your will. So um, now is the time to possibly be thinking about a gift annuity um, solicitation or at least letting your donors know about it. Another one is the charitable lead trust. Um, uh, this, so we're going to have an attorney here, Joe Deeds, and he's going to answer your questions and talk about how these vehicles can be used and just another chance for us to stay in touch next week. So um, please join us uh, next Tuesday at 2 o'clock. And again, please submit any ideas or suggestions you have of ways we can be a better service um, to support all of your work. Thanks so much and hope to see you next week.